Good evening and welcome to another episode of Slantcast, the official podcast of Slant Books. My name is Gregory Wolf and I am Slant's publisher and editor. Thank you for choosing to share this time with us. Tonight, we're looking forward to our book launch for Sleeping As Fast As I Can with author Richard Michelson. But first, a brief word about Slant. I was recently asked by an editor at the Writer's Chronicle to explain what Slant's slant is, so I will shamelessly plagiarize myself. I wrote in that little Q&A, on our blog recently, the poet Rick Chess wrote, I read to be read, to be known, what's present in me and what's lacking. I found this echoed in a recent brilliant, brilliant essay by Garth Greenwell, who believes we are suffering under a hyper-moralistic culture, one that in the pursuit of moral and political righteousness is undermining the very essence of art, which is to probe mystery, ambiguity, and paradox. Greenwell says, the task of art isn't to judge, but to know, to observe, to carry out research into the human. And that, he concludes, is precisely its moral function. We hope slant is a haven for those who believe in that perennial task of literature, those who abhor the idea of what I've called reading for self-congratulation and who prefer their books to be confusing, unsettling, arresting, and ultimately transformative. So that's a little about the vision behind Slant Books. You can read the whole of this brief interview in the current issue of the Writer's Chronicle. You're here for another exciting online book launch event. But before I introduce our reader, I'd just like to remind you that if you have questions for Rich, please feel free to type them in the chat. Time permitting, I will try to share as many of those as possible. I will also post a link to Slant's webpage for sleeping as fast as I can, where you will find several options for purchasing a copy of the book. And now a few words of introduction for our featured author this evening. Richard Michelson's poetry collections include Sleeping As Fast As I Can, More Money Than God, a finalist for the Patterson Prize, Battles and Lullabies, Tap Dancing for the Relatives, and two fri Fine Press Limited Edition collaborations, Masks and Semblant with the artist Leonard Baskin. Michelson wrote the libretto for the off-Broadway music theater piece, Dear Edvard, about the painter Edvard Munch. And his many children's books have been named among the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, and The New Yorker. Michelson has received a National Jewish Book Award, two Sidney Taylor gold medals, and two silver from the Association of Jewish Libraries two Junior Library Guild gold medals, and an International Reading Association Teacher's Choice Award. He has twice been a finalist for the Massachusetts Book Award. A native of East New York, Brooklyn, Michelson served two terms as Poet Laureate of Northampton, Massachusetts, where he hosts NPR, otherwise known as Northampton Poetry Radio, and owns R. Michelson galleries. Finally, I just have to add to this more official biography that of the many fine reviews of his works over the years, possibly the most provocative and meaningful came from Amazon.com, where one so-called reader of Rich's collection, More Money Than God, gave it only one star because the book lacked any sustained discussion of hedge funds and real estate markets. So even with those deficiencies admitted, it's still a great honor and delight to ask Richard Michelson to read from his newest collection from Slant Books, Sleeping As Fast As I Can. Rich? Thank you, Greg, and thank you, everyone. It's good to see some old friends here, uh, some new friends. And uh, 
you are the audience that I get to hear the first reading of this book. So basically, um, you're the experimental audience. We'll see which poems work, which poems don't. Um, if they don't work, then you can complain to Greg because he edited it uh, and he didn't tell me so. Uh, and uh, I should actually read that poem. Uh, I wrote a poem about that one star review. Uh, maybe if I get a chance, I'll, uh, I'll read that poem at the end. We'll see if I remember. Uh, I'm gonna start in my old neighborhood. And uh, this book has a lot of work in various forms, much more so than my previous books. And uh, I'm gonna start at the beginning of my life. Uh, I know, especially these days, uh, it's uh, with a spate of gun violence everywhere. It, that is a major theme in my book. My dad was a victim of gun violence. I lost him very early, uh, a great, um, a great pain in my life. And also I have been fighting now for over 40 years for uh, gun control. Uh, obviously it's a battle I'm losing. It seems to get worse and worse every year. Um, and, uh, but we have no option but to com continue fighting that battle. So this is uh, called Neighborhood Villanelle. Uh, for those non-poets here, if you don't know what a Villanelle is, uh, probably the most famous is uh, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. You probably are somewhat familiar with Dylan Thomas's work. Uh, the, the, uh, the end words repeat, and you'll get a sense as I'm reading how it goes. But this is Neighborhood Villanelle. In this neighborhood, you'd better learn to fight, my father says. Real schoolings from hard knocks. Books won't save your life. He knows I'd rather write and read. I don't talk back. His love is no birthright. Instead, I bluff, act tough. He teaches me to box. In this neighborhood, you'd better learn to fight, he says, or you'll be prey. Better tough Israelite than studious black hat, defenseless orthodox. Books won't save your life. I know you'd rather write. Next day was Hanukkah, the festival of lights. Hey, Jew boy, some kids jeered as if I wore earlocks. I was no Maccabee, bluff called, I could not fight. I came too, battered, bruised, but had no appetite for bloodshed or revenge. Instead, I walked for blocks, prayed, books would save my life. I swore someday I'd write these lines, and now I have. We never kissed goodnight, yet every poem I wrote, he saved. The paradox? A bullet stopped his life, lead plug he could not fight. I escape the neighborhood with every word I write. So um, I think at this point, I'm told one in every three families is uh, affected by or has a family member who has been a victim of gun violence. Uh, it's an everyday occurrence. I wish I could tell you what to do about it. I certainly don't know. Well, I do know. What I don't know is how to make it happen. Um, but uh, it's... Uh, it's the headline every day in the newspaper. Uh, this poem is called Angels with Guns Guarding the Gates of Heaven. And it starts with a uh, epigraph. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Wayne LaPierre, National Rifle Association. The angel staying the dagger raised arm of Abraham was one of the good guys. But studying again, Isaac's binding, painted after Rembrandt, age 29, suffered his firstborn son's death. I find no weapon hidden beneath the wings of God's blue cloak go-between. 
and what to make of Jacob wrestling hand-to-hand combat with his better nature. Faith was all they had in common. Even Reuben's Lucifer-led rebels in their fallen orgy of luscious flesh had only their foolish Flemish selves to censure. So when the president's election committee dubbed as angels, those who had lost loved ones to violence by illegal South American refugees, I wondered which side of the border wall between heaven and hell was left to climb. I was in La Paz, Bolivia, when I came across the master of Calamarca's Archangel Aziel with rifle, which I learned from the Department of Tourism, spawned a convention of gun-toting deities throughout the Andes, Christ's army protecting the faithful. The missionary enforced Catholicism banned the practice of pre-Hispanic religions, and the indigenous Inca thought Spanish firepower supernatural. My grandmother didn't live to see her youngest son, my father, murdered in a Brooklyn gutter by a fifth generation drug addicted, unemployed house painter whose ancestors were dragged here like devils in chains. If there were armed guards inside the temple, the president said after his white nationalist supporter slaughtered 11 in Pittsburgh, they would have been able to stop him. Today, I enter the unlocked door of my Amherst synagogue, once the church where Emily Dickinson also attempted to pray. The light pours through the sanctuary stained glass windows and squinting, I see shadows positing a loaded gun in the poet's hand. We are all Father Abraham and also Isaac the son, she explains. And I confess how once I too believed that a guardian angel walked before each of us unarmed and chanting, make way for the image of the Lord. My uh, dog, oh, you can't see it because I have my gallery background. Um, I do uh, have the honor, my the Jewish community of Amherst is in Emily Dickinson's old church uh, and it's beautiful stained glass windows. Uh, for those local people who've ever been there, it's uh, just a gorgeous old church. Uh, the windows were all donated by the Dickinson family. And uh, it's a wonderful atmosphere uh, to spend some time in. I'm going to now read the longest poem I'm going to read while you still have some energy. Then we'll have some shorter pieces following. Uh, this is a Sestina. Again, as I mentioned, a lot of these poems are in forms in this book. Uh, for those who don't know what a sestina is, uh, it's a poem of six stanzas uh, of six lines each. And the end words of each line repeat in the following stanzas in various orders. And then it has an end of three lines where all six end lines repeat again uh, in the middle of the lines and the end of the lines. Uh, I should also say before I read this poem that in fact, everything in it is true. Uh, I'm bringing in a lot of different uh, ideas from a lot of places. The poem is called Vermin. It was essential. Einstein stated that he bring his violin to Berta Fanta's salon on Prague's Old Town Square. It is 1912, four years until relativity and six before the first wave of the Spanish flu will kill among the 500 million infected. The painter Egon Schiele, already despondent over the death three days earlier, of his lover, Edith, 
and their unborn child. Painting his pregnant lover the day before her death, he could already hear the viola and mournful bassoon of Mozart's Requiem Mass. Ready now to sketch himself dying, he gazes into the small square of his shaving mirror and recalls how he first entered the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts at age 16, even before his initial shave. No younger student accepted before or since. He died never to know he'd won that spot over the 17-year-old Adolf Hitler, who'd later loathed degenerate art and physicist Jews, moving to Berlin to pursue politics, aborting both brush and pen. The square root of time displacing millennia of atoms is music already usurping Einstein's brain. As nodding to Max Brode, he readies his violin under his chin. The pianist, who already has four of his 83 books penned to wide literary acclaim, looks squarely into the eyes of his closest friend, Franz Kafka. Brode loves his quiet companion's unpublished scribblings, which violate all of fiction's conventions. He had offered Franz absinthe for courage before inviting him to Berger's, as if he'd recite the story about a transformation into vermin. Yet, rising to read to his fellow Jews, even Kafka cannot conceive of violence so extreme that each present will be dubbed a cockroach. For now, though, let's leave these imaginative culture lovers in paradise and in a Kafkian absurdity of E equals MC squared, time travel to British Columbia where we'll reappear squarely inside the brothel owned by Bavarian-born Friedrich Trump. Theoretically viable, we can locate the villain who, full of self-love, immigrated at 16 to avoid the military draft. He has already planned a move to Queens, where he'll die five months before Sheila of the same deadly flu his atoms still infecting us via his grandson's love of Hitlerian speech. Even Kafka cannot square anti-alien taunts with Melania's Einstein visa violation. I pray thee, Lord, a fevered Mozart pleads, forgive me, forget me, I am done for. Yesterday um, was Yom HaShoah, as many of you know, a uh, day when we remember those who um, perished in the Holocaust and we remember the Holocaust itself. Um, and this is a sonnet called Life Sentence. And it's about uh, my relation, I guess, to the Holocaust as somebody who often writes about it uh, and certainly did not experience it. And yet it has been a large part of my life. Life sentence. A Holocaust Jew, my grandfather calls me, and not kindly. My identity defined by the negative not passion, not mystery, not awe before the great unknown, but the burden of history and fear, politics above prayer, stuck on the picket line, blindly following, he says, the atheists and unenlightened masses. No arguing 
Where was your God when, when love is not logic? And so I embrace denial and make my nest from the tragic, twig by twig, starving the songbird of my heart till joy passes. Then today, observing his yard site, a small peep of repentance, call it delight, escapes my lips as the candle smoke assumes the form of Hillel, great sage who crafted from words our tombs and, habit, and hammered Torah, his truth and life into a single sentence. What is hateful to you, do not do unto others, a text for every age. But too soon the flame is mute, my mind again consumed with rage. So, uh, so far, we're talking about gun violence, um, the, the, uh, the Holocaust. Um, getting, I'm getting this out of my system in the beginning, okay? And then we'll move to some different things. Um, this book was written in the last five years. Uh, I'm often asked how it differs from some of my earlier books. And I'm sorry to say it's probably uh, certainly darker in vision as you hear. Um, uh, and for those who know me from my children's books, they're often a bit surprised that I often, that I also write adult poetry um, because most of my kids' books are, uh, are certainly lighter, uh, sometimes funny, I hope. Uh, and some of these poems too, I hope. Uh, we will get to have a dark humor. Uh, but the last five years were difficult years for me, uh, both personally and for the country. Uh, I would have never imagined, I would have never imagined uh, the spate of uh, Jew hating and Jew baiting and attacks uh, that we're seeing. Um, and as someone who, uh, lived a good deal of his life um, worrying about anti-Semitism or complaining about anti-Semites. Uh, it was really more of a intellectual exercise for me, I have to say. Um, I felt very safe. Um, I think my friends felt safe. Uh, and it didn't occur that that would change in this lifetime. Uh, also, uh, certainly, uh, I would have never expected that fully half the country, almost, um, would elect who they elected um, and that we'd be in the position that we're in today. Uh, beyond that, um, my mom uh, suffered from dementia and died, a woman I was very, very close to. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a hard five years. Uh, it does take uh, a while till books come out uh, after you're done. I'm working on my next book. Uh, I think I got it all out of my system. My next book is uh, of adult poems I think is funny, but you're not gonna hear that tonight. Uh, we're gonna stay with uh, this book because I was reading from it for the first time and I'm getting used to it a little bit. So. Uh, this book is called Poisoning the Well, and uh, you might know from history uh, that Jews were often blamed for pandemics, uh, the latest as well, but uh, more so uh, the Black Plague was often blamed on Jews, uh, so was the uh, 1918 flu epidemic, uh, and in some cases, uh, Jews early on uh, did better uh, um, with the Black Death than the general population. Uh, so they were easy targets. And of course, there's a reason for that too. They were often uh, in closed off ghettos away from the general population. 
So there was less spread of uh, the disease. And of course, unlike most of the population every Passover, uh, they would clean out their food supplies and uh, kosher the houses and make sure everything was clean. That went a long way towards uh, some of the uh, immunity. Uh, so it also, of course, made them an easy target. Uh, this poem is in rhyme couplets and it's called Poisoning the Well. It was 1348 when the Tulan Jews were first accused of poisoning wells, my grandfather tells me. I refused at eight to wash my hands before dinner. And so a story about purity, the bubonic plague, and God's glory is proper punishment. Though then as now, persecution and rotting cadavers seem to me meager confirmation of heavenly endorsement. When brutalized, some reach toward religion. Others might apostatize or research their inner demons. My grandfather abandoned all trivial delights for Talmudic law, bathing corpses before burial, purging the house of Hametz and cashering the oven each Pesach while I, feather in hand, dusted for leaven. The city's Jews, segregated in a walled off ghetto, escaped pestilence only to face forced repentance or scapegoated to be staked and burned. I think of those pious today on hearing the president cite a Chinese virus to stoke fear while trumpeting ignorance. The mobs attacked to absolve debts, embezzle lands, or appease gods. What fears, I wonder, will my grandchildren understand me to be quelling when I demand they wash their hands? Um, I don't actually have any grandchildren. I say that because I see my son's name on the screen. Um, so uh, I'll just bring it up. Why not? What can he say now? Hi, Sam. Uh, this, is, um, this is another sonnet. It's called Bless You. And it starts with an epigraph. Since sneezing was the first sign of falling ill with the plague, Pope Gregory ordered prayer for, div for divine intercession. That, by the way, is the, uh, the uh, genesis of us blessing each other when we sneeze. Um, it came about because of the uh, plague. Gesundheit, great and Frida calls out, each sneeze another occasion for my soul to abandon my body. I hurry my index finger under my nose horizontally, locking both nostrils as tutored so evil can seize an inhale to fill the void. Denying the devil his due, Frida dubs it, she who at 60 to my six reflexively worries her brow, reaches towards a box of Kleenex and spits over her shoulder. Tonight, eight years older than she was at her death and dining curbside to curtail the coronavirus, I hear two tables over, uh, chew. And for the first time in years, measure the distance between superstition and truth. Around me, panic, as mid-forkful, everyone freezes. May God keep us upwind from all airborne diseases.
So um, I mentioned my mother's uh, passing, which uh, happened while I was writing this book and in many ways took over this book. Um, my mother and I were very, very close. Uh, I still call her regularly on my phone and then remember that uh, she's not at the other end. Uh, but for some reason, I leave the number there and every time um, I need to talk to someone, my instinct kicks in. Uh, my mother was uh, a lovely woman um, and uh, uh, I think uh, she was, even at the end, she loved doing crossword puzzles and playing Scrabble. I think I got my love for words from her. And uh, even at the very end, when she no longer uh, was the person that she was and she did not understand what words meant, uh, she still played a mean ga game of Scrabble and she could still beat me to the end. Uh, she didn't know, she couldn't remember what the words she would put down meant anymore, but she could still come up with words. Uh, you know, it was kind of amazing. Anyways, um, I suggested at one point that she write her own obituary. And this is called also Life Sentence. In this book, there are a number of poems called Life Sentence uh, in all its various meanings. It's like speed dating at a mortician's convention, my mother explains. The first sentence must awe, wow, or shock, entertain, or risk a reader's waning attention before truth's modest list of achievements. It's only now I understand that the creative writing seminar I insisted she join at the assisted living facility, Elevator to Heaven, has cast her as entrepreneur and God as venture capitalist. 60 seconds to make her eternal pitch, as though even the afterlife can't improve upon our uninspired dreams of everlasting success. Enough plot or too literary, she asks, reading from her initial draft, which seems a peculiar question while composing one's obituary. But for now, she's alert and focused as she revises text, laboring her life into art, undeterred by what comes next. So my mother's name was Caroline. And um, when she lost her ability, um, well, to think clearly, um, and she was in the memory care unit. I'm sure a lot of people have gone through this. Um, it's a difficult time, uh, yet uh, it was not my mother who was there, um, but she was also, the woman who was there seemed much happier than my mother ever was. <laughs> my mother was never particularly, um, happy, you, you know, she would not be a person who you would say was overjoyed with life. Um, but when she lost her sense of herself and I would visit her or visit this person, um, she was happy. Um, and that was something I had to think about, you know, um, how are we still the same person as our personalities change? Uh, where is the core of us? And um, I loved her uh, just as much, but it was a different person. Uh, anyways, uh, the first time I uh, visited her on my way into the memory care unit, um, she was in music therapy and waving her arms. I saw from a distance around her. And this poem is called Sweet Caroline. Uh, looking at the screen, most of you are in my age kind of frame uh, and you will know the Neil Diamond song. Sweet Caroline. From this distance, you could be shooing flies, but as I exit independent living to enter the memory care unit, 
I can see performing Neil Diamond's dip shake swivel, the resonant accordionist. According to Wiesenthal, evil flourishes when the good do nothing and the evidence is everywhere. Yet from here, watching you dance to the wheeze and bellow, a choir of cafeteria aides praising your name with every chorus, I think of the arrays of the brain, our synapses endlessly reinventing us. Dementia is lessened by music therapy, the director mentions, which has potential to ameliorate your mother's depression. And so I watch you sway and clap. Your expression unrecognizable is, dare I say the word, sweet. Oh, Caroline, you who prized vinegar above honey, resigned to life's bitter truths, a husband's murder, an indifferent God, now, finally, sing. Good times never seen so good. I, um, I did a spot on the radio this morning and uh, uh, the, uh, the host asked me to read this poem and they had uh, the song queued up as it went to break, um, which was very nice in the background. Um, I don't know, uh, maybe we can ask Greg to unmute himself and sing for us a little bit. Um, be nice in the, well, or, or maybe not. Um, okay, let's see. couple of more of my mother poems, and then I'm going to end with a couple of poems. This was uh, my mother's advice to me at one point. Again, it is a sonnet. It's called, My Dying is Not Tragic. My dying is not tragic, my mother says. So save your petitions and poems. If any God is listening to her recitation of fanatical faith in the existence of no God, I entreat them to not misinterpret acquiescence as contentment. I will not, she mocks, resurrect in a graveyard, nor haunt your waking dreams. Every second, she explains, more than 100 humans die. 600 since I said this last sentence. There will never be justice for those murdered children or their parents forever suffering unspeakable pain. I'm in her hospital room, the TV blaring another school shooting, officials offering thoughts and prayers. My dying is not tragic, my mother repeats adding, as if awed by nature's mathematics, my heart beat its wings four billion times. She's computing pulses per minute times years. Outside her window, a hummingbird hovers. Miraculous, she whispers, as if sanctifying that word. And the last in this series, unveiling. At the university in Tel Aviv, the scientists have printed a miniature human heart, 3D, rabbit sized, but replete, the researcher used her own cells with blood vessels, mitral valves, ventricles, kava. When my mother's muscles stopped beating, moments before I gave the surgical center my written non-intervention permission, I became aware for the first time of the warren of my body, its escape routes and artificial enclosures. No soul, but soil, my mother taught, and it stuck. Afterlife of neither God nor prayer, but pebble, mud, dirt. And yet, one year to the day, my sister and I gather graveside 
to recite, transliterated, the mourner's Kaddish after divesting the monument of its covering cloth. Ritual complete, complete, we fold into vehicles, two emergency medical cooler torsos, transporting home our temporary holy hearts. All right. Um, let's see. Two more. So Kafka, for some reason, shows up in many of my poems. Um, he's always putting his head into it. Um, I he's had him in the poem Vernon, uh, Vermin earlier. Uh, and this is a poem called Reading Kafka to My Daughter. Um, and uh, it's something she still remembers. Uh, I did not read much as a child. Uh, I was not read to as a child that I remember. Uh, and I think when my kids were very young, I don't know, maybe Sam will um, correct me, fact check me. Uh, I didn't read a lot to them until they were uh, a bit older. Uh, it just never occurred to me. Uh, now, of course, I write children's books and um, it's my mission in life is to get children reading uh, early, et cetera. Um, so when I started out um, reading to my kids, I would, you know, if I had to read to them, uh, I'd read what I was reading uh, myself to them. Uh, I probably scarred them for life. Reading Kafka to my daughter. It was a second grade sleepover in the open space recently renovated above our garage and seven seven-year-old girls dizzying their bodies in the way a story consumes the one spinning it, a chrysalis of choice and misdirection until you emerge unrecognizable even to yourself. It happened that I was in the basement reading The Metamorphosis when my wife got the call from her mother and left me alone. Well, not alone one of eight in the house before bedtime. And so it came to pass that I, rolling out the plastic mat with the wide colored circles, stood among shrieks and giggles as the numerous, if pitifully thin limbs transmuted, left foot red, right hand green, into a single multi-headed overtired insect. But that, the incessant shape-shifting of our forms and minds is not what I wanted to say. Nor is this poem about the calls my wife fielded all the following week about the inappropriateness of reading Kafka, how could he, to prepubescence? No, I share this only to better remember the morning after the nightmare when I went to wake them their tangled intentions and odd dreams twisted protectively around each other. Then suddenly, like a field of sunflowers, each tilted her face toward the skylight, petals extended upward as if stretching to touch daybreak's bright yellow sphere. I could read that because my daughter is not on Zoom. Um, I'm skipping poems that mention my son <laughs> um, because I didn't ask for permission ahead of time, you know. Um, let's see here. I'm going to end with one last sonnet. And, uh, and I thank you all for listening. Um, this is literally outside of one poem, the first time I've written, read any of these out loud. Uh, so I'm uh, figuring out, uh, I've read them to myself, of course, out loud, uh, but that's a whole different thing. Uh, so I'm figuring out what's working, what's not working. I might go in and make Greg reprint the whole book, you know, change this word, change that word, um, but I won't. This is called Meditation After Casting My Sins 
upon the waters. As if God had kicked the crutch of belief out from under the wind. Let me start this over, sorry. Meditation after casting my sins upon the waters. As if God had kicked the crutch of belief out from under the limbs of the wounded. As if our souls were unwanted weekend guests in the summer beach house of the body. As if I were still the magician's prepubescent assistant, waving my skinny arm and wand. I will create as I speak, the Lord once saith, in Aramaic no less, avra kadavra, distracting us with cape and hat and that sly cunning grin. Oh, how I envied his deep voice and gift for misdirection. And how my astonishment at this morning's small miracle, when up early and stumbling at the shore, I saw as I fell face down into the shallows, my sins swimming about me like a school of minnows. No, I mean my own fingers, all 10 of them intertwining into a gesture of prayer. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rich. Uh, just wonderful. We're so grateful to, to have this time to hear this, the poems in your own voice, uh, which I think is, it, is always, you know, an incredible gift. <coughs> and uh, we've had a number of people sharing beautiful thoughts here in the chat. Only one question though, but it's a substantial one. Dale asks, Rich, can you talk about writing in form? Do you start a poem and then realize it's a sonnet or villanelle? <laughs> or do you start with the directive to write in form and then discover the content? Well, it figures, Dale. <laughs> Dale and I went to MFA, got our MFAs together. Um, so uh, I actually find that um, the closer or the more emotional that a poem is to me, a subject that I'm writing in, um, that I need a form. Uh, the, more, the more emotional the poem, the more necessary the form. I need something to contain the, um, the raw emotion. Um, otherwise, uh, I lose track of where I am uh, and I get a bit maudlin. Uh, so I find that uh, in many ways, it's probably not that different than, you know, uh, my mom's old crossword puzzles, you know, trying to figure out where things fit. Um, and uh, I have a couple of poems in this book about her doing crossword puzzles uh, and how uh, the rage, I saw the rage inside her encouragement, you know, playing with letters and words and tunes. Um, so, uh, so this book, because this book was probably the most, you know, nearest to me dealing with um, almost all the poems about my mom uh, and my dad's murder are in form. Um, and, uh, and then I got comfortable in it. So, uh, yes, I do. Um, the big question for me is what is not whether I'm going to be informed, but what form the poem is going to, what form it's going to take. Uh, and I'll often try various forms and I never quite know, uh, where, where I'm going to end up or where I'm going to go. Um, but the sonnet seems to be a good length for me uh, for the poems about my mom in general. Um, I don't know why that is, but it just seems to be. Uh, when I'm dealing with poems that have more, that both involve something like, you know, my dad's death, but also the greater world in itself, I know I can't contain that in such a small base. Uh, so I might try a sestina, 
which is going to give me more room to practice uh, or, um, you know, or uh, couplets, which can go on forever. Uh, so I'll play with it. Um, but in many ways, yeah, it's, it's like um, uh, the form helps me figure out what the next word should be. And if I'm working and it won't happen, like if it just, if one form just isn't working, I'll see if a different form might work. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll try that. I'll pick a line from later in the poem that might rhyme with um, a line from the first two and say, well, if I move this up here, how will the poem then continue down the page? Uh, so I might have various lines um, and then I'll mix them up and see if I can reconnect them in some way because it wasn't working in one of the forms. Um, I'll, I, I just, uh, you know, find that interesting. I've, uh, you know, I, I have, I've, and as I did that more and more in the book, I started just wanting to try out different forms. So I basically, you know, went to, um, you know, went online and looked at some of my books to see what other forms I had that I were missing uh, that I hadn't tried before. And then I thought if um, I have one poem that I will read, but um, I wrote my very first, uh, my very first guzzle, uh, which is the Iranian form, um, where the last word of every two lines repeats. Um, and I found that that form was much more uh, elastic for humor, as, uh, as is often the couplet line. Um, because of the close rhymes, I can put some dry humor in or that sort of thing. Um, much more difficult to do that as a sustainer or a sonnet for me. I hope that answers some of your questions. If not, you can call me later. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, here's another one from Mary. Um, do you set aside time to write poetry or do you find that a poem demands the time to be written? Um, I, uh, I am not one of these, what, I, I'm not a person who can write anywhere, anytime. Um, I, uh, and I'm always, uh, I'm a bit uh, suspect of people who um, tell me poems come to them. Uh, I, um, I consider po you know, writing poems not that dissimilar from playing the piano or learning an instrument. Um, you practice every day. You can miss some days if you can, but if you miss too many days, it's hard to get back to it. Um, and most of what I, you know, most of the time you practice and practice and it doesn't work. Um, but if you're sitting there uh, long enough, often enough, uh, you're there when it does work. Uh, so I do try, uh, you know, uh, certainly when I was younger and raising children uh, and running my gallery and trying to write, uh, I would get up or very early and work, you know, uh, every day. Uh, now that I'm not on such a schedule, uh, I find that I don't necessarily get more done, frankly. <laughs> I also don't have the energy I had, uh, but, um, you know, I, I think that, I think that you need a practice and it's like anything uh, as well. It's no different than going to the gym. I find that, you know, when I go to the gym every day, I get in the habit and then I miss it terribly when I miss a day. If I, you know, forget for a couple of weeks or three weeks or I'm out of town, it's hard to get the muscles back in shape. Uh, it's hard to get back into the routine. Um, and I think it's all about routine uh, for me anyway. So it's, it's not, about, um, not about a stroke of lightning. Uh, it's not about inspiration. It's about doing it every day. I wish it weren't, but it is. 
Well, Rich, I, I hope you do it many, many more days uh, so that we can be the beneficiaries of, of further collections. Um, happy and sad. Um, I want to, I'm grateful to those who asked questions, also those who offered such beautiful comments. Rich, I, before we close this, literally close this program down, I hope you have a chance to glance at some of the beautiful uh, sentiments shared there. And I will just wrap up here with a few uh, practical words. Um, I, uh, I, I love watching you there against the backdrop of your gallery. It makes me very uh, homesick for that part of the world. I, I grew up on the South Shore of Boston, so I'm not completely unfamiliar with the landscape and the culture. And I always think of you along with some of my other sort of Massachusetts literary mafia friends, particularly uh, Barry Moser and Paul Mariani. Um, so God willing, we'll be able to hoist a, a glass of some some kind uh, before too long in your neck of the and woods. For those who are local, as you know, I'll be reading with Paul Mariani uh, this coming Sunday at the gallery, uh, who also has a amazing two amazing poetry uh, books out with Slant, and uh, they're worth everyone looking at. And the other thing that really moves me uh, about you. Rich is just that I feel a real kinship. Um, I think both of us really have a great heart for creating venues for the arts, um, places where people can gather and connect and share and be be moved and edified. So um, I, I love that we do that in our different ways, uh, but in, in similar ways as well. Well, my friends, Sleeping As Fast As I Can is available for purchase in cloth-bound paperback and ebook editions through all major online retailers. If you go to the book's webpage at slantbooks.org, you can find links to several of those outlets, so you can pick whichever one you, you prefer um, to order from or find your own. Uh, I put that link in the chat box. I'll, I'll paste it in again in just a moment. Just a couple of final notes. 2023 is actually the 10th anniversary of Slant's founding. And by the way, I'm sure some of you probably guessed that the name of our press is derived from your very own Emily Dickinson out there in that part of the world. Tell all the truth, but tell it Slant. Uh, so to celebrate the 10th anniversary, we are putting on a, a sale. Um, a number of our titles are available, including hardcovers for discounts ranging from 33 to 50%. So to find that sale, just go to our website, again, slantbooks.org, and then click on the link at the top of that homepage, and it'll take you straight to the sale page. Tonight's event has been recorded and will soon be available on the Slant Book page, our YouTube channel, and of course, through Slantcast. You can now subscribe to Slantcast through all the major podcast outlets, including Spotify, Apple, Audible, and many, many others. Please remember that small indie presses like Slant are supported by tax-deductible donations. They make possible the choice of publishing books that are bold and innovative and, yes, challenging, books like Sleeping As Fast As I Can. To support our work, just go to slantbooks.org and click on Donate. Finally, remember to tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Thanks, and see you again next time.